This is the second part of my talk on direct democracy. I've covered American democracy, Soviet democracy, social democracy. I'm now looking at the technology that exists using modern communications devices to support direct democracy. It's clear you can't get everyone into the town hall anymore to have a vote. So how can you achieve the aims that the Social Democrats originally had of legislation by the people and popular votes and taxation and expenditure? Below we're going to give some techniques which can be used either at the state level or at the level of citizens resistance movements to stop undemocratic state decisions. An example of, of uh, using plebiscites as a resistance movement was the way the campaign against water privatisation in Scotland used a plebiscite in Glasgow to block um, water privatisation. The plebiscite was unofficial or at least was only backed by the city council but it had such an overwhelming majority against water privatisation that we succeeded in stopping the whole thing. Now, if you're going to have an electronic voting system, it must be accessible, it must be anonymous, so that no one knows how you voted, it must be verifiable, and it must be free from manipulation. And we advocate using mobile phones because they're the most accessible and common device. Computers have the disadvantage that because of their complexity you don't know what the voting software is actually doing. There could be back channels in it that change your vote or that uh, reveal to someone else the way you voted. They're also expensive. Um, internet computers are not as widely available as mobile phones. So there may only be one in a house so that people may not be confident that the way they vote is hidden from other people in the house. So we opted to use mobile devices. We call our system HandyVote after the, the German term for a mobile phone. You start off by registering to vote. Any voting system needs a, a registration procedure to ensure that only eligible voters uh, vote and that only people only have the opportunity to vote once. This is done by people getting a voting card, but the way they get the voting card has to be randomised. The simplest way to randomise it would be when you go to register to vote, you put your hand in a jar and pull out a voting card in a sealed envelope so that no one knows which voting card and which voter's number you've got. Voting itself can be done using either simple Nokia phones, smartphones, or in principle, though we've never tried this, landlines. At the end of the vote, all the results are shown and the, the votes are all inspectable by the general public to verify that results have been correctly tallied. The experimental voting cards we've used look like this. They have a number to which you send a text message written on the vote back of the card. They have your voting number which will be unique. The voting number is divided into two fields. I've shown a very short one here but typically for a, a large population the number would be longer. Um, the first four or the first eight digits would be your unique identifier and then there is a pin number, a four digit pin number afterwards. But the first four or the first eight digits in a longer number are unique. If you're num This is for uh, an example using comparatively small vo voting population that we did in a, a teachers union. If your number was 44230796 and you wanted to vote yes to a question you'd send four for 230796 followed by a 1 for the yes, otherwise you follow it by 2 for a no. You vote by sending an SMS message with your card ID. No one knows what your card ID is, so this is anonymous. I previously checked that with people working for 
one of the main mobile phone companies in Britain will the contents of mobile phone messages are recorded by the company and they said no they only record the source and destination so the message itself is not recorded since nobody knows the ID the ID is anonymous um, at the end the verification is by the publication of which card IDs which voted which way and you can look at this to check that your own vote was recorded directly and they're, they're listed in numerical order so you can easily scan through the list to find your number and see whether it's in the list of yes votes or the list of no votes these will be published on the web only the leading digits are shown but the leading digits are unique to your card the vote's still anonymous as we say since no one knows your number So, how would you apply this? The system I've just described is okay for voting on yes or no questions. What about voting on economic questions? Here you need to balance expenditure against taxes, and this is true both in a socialist or a capitalist economies. The difference is that in the latter case, you would measure expenditure in terms of labour time and tax people's labour accounts. But how can people vote on a quantitative question like this? Well, a simple way of doing it is to give people a range of options. Now, here's a local authority example where there are two main items of expenditure, libraries and schools, and people are given the option of increasing expenditure on libraries by 5%, leaving it as it is, cutting it by 5%. Uh, for schools, they can cut it by 5%, leave it as it is, raise it by 5%. And they also can vote on how much they want to alter taxes. And given not everyone will vote the same way, you can work out the average change in expenditure taxes that people want. However, there's an obvious problem with this. There is a danger that people simply vote to spend more than they vote in taxes. They might vote, for example, to increase expenditure on libraries and schools by 4%, but only increase taxes by 2%. You can actually solve this analytically by a formula in analytic geometry, which I won't go into here. But a simple picture illustrates how it works. Suppose people vote for 4% more expenditure and 2% more taxes. There is a line where increases in expenditure match the increase in taxation. Let's call that the feasible set. And you move the point where they voted to the closest point on the feasible set. Now in general, if you've got an n-dimensional voting system and you have one constraint, the constraint of, um, that taxes must pay for expenditure, then you have an n1 minus 1 dimensional manifold and what you're trying to do is finding the closest point on the manifold to the point in the n dimensional space that people have voted. The, in this case it's very easy to see what it does. The geometric procedure gives a, a sensible result. Um, it gives you a 3% increase in expansion, a 3% increase in, in taxes, a compromise between what people uh, voted for on taxes and what they voted for on expenditure. But the, the maths works to arbitrary dimensionality and the maths package is built into our voting system. We've had field trials of it. Um, we had two local campaigning issues. The, the Kelvinside Meadow opinion poll. Residents were consulted about the future of the North Kelvin Meadow and Children's Wood which property developers wanted to turn into housing and um, activists organised a local poll 